Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 108, The Germans Are Coming. Let's see, where were we before we took that tiny Churchill detour? Ah, yes. In North Africa, Operation Compass, a brilliant but limited offensive that pushed the Italians all the way from City Barani, the furthest point east Marshal Graziani had led his troops on their way to Egypt, all the way back to Batafam, a coastal town along the western side of Cyrenaica, which lent its name to the last battle of February 7, 1941, that saw the end of the nine divisions of the Italian 10th Army. This staggering victory, a much-needed victory, considering the Blitz back home, was accomplished by Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor and his two understrength British Commonwealth divisions. Of course, credit also goes to O'Connor's superior, General Jumbo Wilson, whose organizational skill meant that the Army of the Nile had what it needed for victory, if only just. And to the C&C Middle East, Sir Archibald Wavell, who had the intestinal fortitude to stand in between Churchill, who desired O'Connor's armor, artillery, and aircraft elsewhere, and the little terrier, as the Aussies called O'Connor, so he could continue on handing Mussolini one of his greatest defeats. Greek soldiers were currently handing Il Duce another one. Mussolini's invasion of Greece was meant to have been his parallel war to Hitler's astounding successes in the West. It was also meant to demonstrate the might of this latest Roman Empire. Problem was, the mettle of Mussolini's men was being blunted in Greece as well as North Africa. Actually, blunted is not the correct term, more like it was being flattened. The three main thrusts of Italian troops that had been allowed to come deep inside Greek territory to destabilize their supply lines had, by the end of 1940, been pushed back. Two of those armies, now in shambles, had retreated back into Albanian territory, but still weren't safe. While the third army, the largest, the Julia Division, advancing along the west coast, just south of Albania, no longer existed, but had been reduced to unorganized men in torn clothes with no supplies, running north for their lives. Meanwhile, in East Africa, British Commonwealth forces were devouring territory held by the Duke of Aosta, the cousin of Italian King Victor Emmanuel III, faster than anyone thought possible. British General Platt had his men advancing east from Katorum, the main city of the Sudan, into western Eritrea, which was being defended by Italian General Fruski. But once the Italians retreating east with the aggressors, the 4th Indian Division, only one step behind, reached the Dungalas Gorge, they decided this was the place to hold fast, and it was a solid decision. The opening to the gorge was flanked on either side by mountain cliffs that rose 2,000 feet. The Italians set up their more numerous artillery on the right, higher mountain, from the British perspective, and prepared to blast anything that came near the opening. And the area immediately in front of the gorge was relatively flat. Any advance would be seen well before the front could be reached. So now, the Commonwealth forces under Beresford Pierce were stymied and frustrated, especially after enjoying the chase that now had abruptly ended. After all, if the gorge could be penetrated... Not much seemed to be in the 4th and 5th Indian Division's path all the way to Karen, another important city. If Karen were reached, then it was all but over. The all-important port city, the Duke's main base of Misawa, was within their grasp, and hopefully so too was the Duke himself. But, try as they might, the Allied forces spent late January and early February banging their heads against the Italian defense. The rest of February was spent staring at the mountain wall and trying to recover from the blood they had shed on the sun-bleached rocks. A bit further south, Colonel Wingate, with the Ethiopian emperor Haile Selassie by his side, had pushed through the thick jungle to emerge from the Gajam region 
to threaten General Natale's troops that held Addis Ababa, the capital. But first, the attackers had been held up at Burye, between the capital and where the Allies had exited the jungle. Having vastly fewer men, Colonel Wingate used the presence of the Emperor to gather adherents as well as psychological tactics to frighten Natalie and his men, even before combat could be joined. And finally, turning our gaze further south, to the area between eastern Kenya and western Italian Somaliland, with Major General Cunningham in command, but General Godwin Austin on the scene, Operation Canvas, manned by several South African divisions, had driven through the jungle, outmaneuvering or outfighting the Italians, until the port city of Kismayu and several river or hinterland forts were taken. This was all done as a noose of dwindling supplies ever tightened around the Allies' neck. Kismayu fell on February 14th, the smaller surrounding forts, days later. But the vast majority of Italian troops escaped to the east, further into Italian Somaliland. There was nothing for it but to resupply and continue the pursuit. However, there was an unstoppable adversary on the way, and there was no amount of heart or fighting spirit that could thwart it. And that was the coming monsoons. So it was decided to arm and equip only three brigades as best as possible, and send them east in pursuit. The idea was to advance while ever pushing the Italians and making for Mogadishu, then turn north and make for Harar, deep in eastern Abyssinia. If all went well, and the men could stay ahead of the heavy rains that destroyed roads, the African soldiers would eventually link up with General Platt's forces in Eritrea. That is, if the Italians continued to allow themselves to be so pliable and disheartened. North Africa After General Richard O'Connor's latest success at Betafam, he privately hoped that history would repeat itself. Well, his immediate history anyway. Namely, that London would recognize his victory and grant him another limited advance. And this one would take him into Tripoli. To his mind, as the man on the spot, Surely his view would be given its due weight, that a far more possible success in North Africa was preferable to a slim-chanced adventure in Greece. But going on the assumption that if wishes were horses, beggars would ride, O'Connor sought to nudge the stakes a bit by sending Wavell's representative, Dorman Smith, to General Maitland Jumbo Wilson with his request to proceed. Wilson, as the Little Terrier's immediate commander, had to approve this request, which he did, thinking along the same lines as O'Connor. So on continued Dorman Smith with Jumbo's blessing to see and see Wavell's office. But as we have seen, when Dorman Smith showed up at headquarters at 10 a.m. on February 12th, the maps of North Africa that had hung on the walls were now replaced with maps of Greece. Wavell, acknowledging the man, said, with a baleful wave of his hand, You see, Eric, I'm starting my spring campaign. And putting the last nail in the coffin of O'Connor's hopes, Churchill, when he wrote to Wavell, congratulating him, and specifically the commander of 13th Corps, on the success of Operation Compass, he added, But this does not alter. Indeed, it rather confirms our previous directive, namely, that your major effort must now be to aid Greece and or Turkey. This rules out any serious effort against Tripoli. You should therefore make yourself secure in Benghazi and concentrate all available forces in the Delta in preparation for a move to Europe. And with this, the 13th Corps, the Army of the Nile, that had given London, the Blitzed Island Nation, its people, indeed the Western world, hope was disbanded. Still, there were those, like C&C Wavell, though passively, and members of the Imperial General Staff, not to mention General Dill, chief of the Imperial General Staff, that still, however passively, fought for O'Connor's dream. But Churchill was energized by his emotion, which made him strong, but sometimes aired his aim and clouded his judgment. This was one of those times. 
and German General Erwin Rommel, commander of the Tripoli-bound 15th Panzer Division, who himself had landed at Tripoli on February 12th, just days after the Battle of Betafam, would make much of this. Still, as all the players of this tale were human, with their own foibles, it occurred to some that perhaps General O'Connor might simply ignore his orders and continue on. The Italians could not have stopped him, regardless of his Commonwealth Army's exhausted state. Perhaps he could achieve another success that would force London to accept it as fact. Other generals from countries all over the world had done so. After all, who shoots a man for success? But that was not Richard O'Connor's way. In fact, for those who were with him at this very moment, even they could not tell of his pain and indignation at being pulled up short. Even after the war, he would not speak out against this decision. Of the great tragedy, all he would ever write was, Suffice to say that I was sorry, for our own selfish reasons, that the Greek campaign had been decided on. That was it. He would have to succor himself with his ten-week campaign that penetrated 500 miles into enemy territory, that had erased an enemy army of nine divisions, that had captured 130,000 prisoners, 400 tanks, and 1,290 guns, all at the cost of 467 men killed, 1,223 wounded, and 43 missing. Now that Churchill's wish was the law of the land, the 13th Corps was scattered, replaced by a static command, now called Cyrenaica Command. The men of the 7th Armored Division were scattered to unimportant duties. O'Connor himself, still suffering with stomach problems, became the general officer commanding British troops in Egypt, Jumbo Wilson's former command, while he himself was placed in charge of the Cyrenaica Command. However, in charge of the green and mostly unequipped troops under Wilson was now General Neen. He would be the first one to feel the mettle of Rommel's style of command. Sadly for the British and the Allies in general, the men under General Neen were comprised of one Australian Brigade group and one untried armor brigade of the 2nd Armored Division, of which too many of the tanks they used were captured Italian machines. But this arrangement was not as foolhardy as it first may appear. By British and German estimates, Rommel would not be able to move east until May, at the very earliest, mid-April, which would give the Allies about enough time to see how things turned out in Greece, vis-a-vis -vis British military assistance there. And based on this, Hitler himself had told Rommel that all he was allowed to do for now was to plan for the reconquest of Cyrenaica, and that his troops were not to move beyond Agatabia, about 65 miles south of Betafam, until the 15th Panzer Division was disembarked. And that landing date had not been set in stone, could not be set in stone, due to British warships patrolling the Mediterranean. Of the many things that reports, timetables, and estimates cannot tell a CNC, or even a dictator, is what is in the heart and mind of a leader of men. Indeed, if it were possible, and of course it was not, more could have been learned by the British about Rommel by simply watching him for one day as he inspected the disposition of his Italian and few German troops and equipment. For Rommel was a doer, a leader, in the best sense. Timetables would not dictate his move. The only thing he needed or wanted to know was the fortitude of the adversaries in front of him. He knew his own mind. Sadly, the fortitude opposite him now did not make him hold up. The only way to stop Rommel, and this was simply his idea of combat, was to physically stop him. So the man, soon to be crowned the Desert Fox, moved out his first German units to Sirte, which is 160 miles west of Agi Badia on February 16th, just four days after he arrived. This small advance allowed Rommel to assess the British. Again, he was not impressed, so moved up more of his forces on March 31st. 
The resistance he met, when it did come, was timid, and worse, uncoordinated. So he kept moving, kept pushing his men, who, at the very least, appreciated his passion for combat, his confidence. Here was a man to follow. With what little he had to operate with, for now, untried Italian reserves and a smattering of German units, the Axis forces came on in three groups. Along the coast road past Benghazi, along the route O'Connor's men used at Emsis Makili, and further south toward Makili Derna. Unsurprisingly, Neem's green men scattered before this surprise attack. This was not supposed to be happening. But Wavell, seeing this, thought he was being proactive when he sent the still alien O'Connor to Neem as an advisor. And being the equally driven man he was, the author of Operation Compass arrived on the scene on April 3rd. Yet three days later, the British lost their greatest desert fighter to date, as he and Neem were captured, when their car got lost in the dark and came upon a German detachment, operating behind enemy lines, just as the little terrier would have done. North Africa, Epilogue When General O'Connor's men were moving beyond Tobruk during Operation Compass, the Director of Military Intelligence, stationed in London, used information gleamed from Luftwaffe Enigma signals, the German railway Enigma signals, and messages flowing between the Abwehr to estimate the number of German divisions stationed in Romania at 23. The truth was really nine. This deception, of course, comes from German counterintelligence. It was their job to confuse the enemy. Added to this faulty information was intelligence gathered by the British Embassy in Bucharest, that claimed to have discovered the German timetable for their Greek invasion. They claimed that German forces would cross the Bulgarian border on February 17th. The Director of Military Intelligence then used this to predict that German forces would cross into Greek territory by March 12th, with at least five divisions. And once a hole was punched in the Greek lines, five additional German divisions would make for Athens, probably arriving in late April. With this timetable before them, the British War Cabinet, the body that ran the war, decided that, indeed, there was enough time to insert British forces into Greece before the Germans arrived. And so, on February 11th, just days after the Battle of Betafam, instructed Wavell not to proceed to Tripoli, but to make ready to send his tanks and artillery to Greece. So, Taking all this into consideration, how were three British Commonwealth Infantry Divisions and one Armoured Brigade supposed to repel a German force of at least five divisions, probably more, in the jungles and mountains of Greece? The Greeks themselves were ran ragged in their inspired defense of their country. They needed time, months, not weeks, to refit, repair, and resupply. They, as well as the battered Italian troops, were negligible at this point. This is what is meant when it has been said that Churchill was leading with his heart instead of his head, as touching the Greek campaign. There is only so much any force can do. Unless each Commonwealth soldier could kill 100 Germans before he himself was shot or wounded, this insertion was doomed to fail. In fact, only two weeks after the fateful February 11th decision to stop O'Connor in his tracks, did the Director of Military Intelligence write, We must be prepared to face the loss of all forces sent to Greece. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. For you listeners who have a certain amount of time under your belt, you'll know as well as I do that life will not hesitate to throw you a curveball. And you know the drill. You have to play through regardless. Life demands no less. But you don't have to do it alone. BetterHelp Online Therapy will assess your needs and can match you with your own licensed professional therapist in less than 48 hours. I was in therapy in my 20s, and it pretty much set me up well for the next few decades. Also, my wife has used BetterHelp to deal with things when she felt out of control. We are both better people for it. 
And just know you can send a message at any time to your therapist and you do not have to appear on camera if you don't want to. Why? Because everything is set up to make you feel comfortable. In the end, all you need to remember is that better help is a great way to invest in yourself. And they have a special offer for my listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash World War II. That's 10% off your first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash World War II. Meanwhile, in Greece, General Papagos, the leader of the Greek forces, now that he had broken the Italian assault, was focused on simply not allowing the Italians to renew their offensive, as incredible as that may sound. Papagos was a conservative military thinker, but no one could deny the part he played in this successful rebuttal of Italian aggression. He knew that his men were suffering just as badly as the supposed invaders. By now, the Greek soldiers had thick beards that were riddled with lice. Their clothes were in tatters, their stomachs empty. Only their hearts remain untouched. But at times like this, man does live by bread alone. For example, the Greeks opposing the remnant Julia division were still hitting their adversaries whenever they could, but their punches were getting weaker and weaker. Fortunately for the Greeks, the Italians were even worse off. By now, the Julia division was down to 1,000 men, 15 guns, and 5 mortars, and each night brought new deaths as frostbite set in. Cavallero the newly appointed chief of staff, had received intelligence that not only had Greek civilians been aiding their country's soldiers, no surprise there, but so too were the Albanian civilians, which had been expected to help the Italians. But had he known the extent of Albanian assistance, he would have called off the whole thing right then and there. The locals, tired of their Italian overlords, had not only brought food to their liberators, had taken in wounded Greek soldiers, but when they saw that these men were too weak to walk through the deeper snows, had old women walk in front of them with wheelbarrows, carving out a path for the combatants to drag their guns. But what's more, when Italian air patrols discovered this, they swooped down and opened fire on the black-clad women, their clothes making them easy targets. But as the planes flew away, other black-clad women, again elderly, but currently stronger than the Greek men, who now looked like phantoms, came out, dragged the bodies away, and took their place, walking, this time, pulling sleds in front of the soldiers. The wheelbarrows had equally been shot to pieces. On December 20th, 1940, Greek forces took Port Pamero and then attacked Hamara along the coast. And such was the confusion amongst the Italians that at certain moments in the battle, Italian air power strafed their own men as they retreated, the pilots thinking them Greek forces advancing, because by now everyone's clothes were in the same pathetic condition. Just three days before this latest clash, the Italian commanders in Albania realized they no longer had any reinforcements. So quickly were they used up in trying to stem the Greek counteroffensive. But after the success of Hamara, the Greeks were utterly spent. They occasionally sent in small units to test and check the Italian lines, but they too were sleeping out in the open, their equipment all but used up. Only occasionally would an RAF Blenheim, after careful reconnaissance, drop a load of supplies near their Greek allies. About this time, snow began to fall in Rome. Of course, all Mussolini had to do was walk inside his palace, away from the terrace where he had given his great speeches. He publicly said that he approved of the snow and cold. It would kill off the weaklings and improve this mediocre Italian race. Such was his disgust with his own people. The Italian pilots certainly had it better than their infantry brethren. Well, the ones that were still alive. On December 21st, Air Vice Marshal D'Albiac reported that RAF planes had shot down 39 enemy planes, while only losing 9 
of their own. But the British were certainly doing more than that. On Christmas Day, RAF aircraft dropped much-needed supplies on the island of Corfu. The civilians there had been bombed by frustrated Italian pilots that left many of the civilians homeless at the worst time of the year. But this limited success of the RAF was a double-edged sword. Even though British aid to Greece at this point was only 5,000 RAF staff, indeed the Greeks still saw this contest as an Italian-Greco affair, Hitler weighed British aid heavier than it was, and planned accordingly. Soon after, the humbled Il Duce met with Hitler at Salzburg, and Hitler, though wrapping his fellow dictator hard across the knuckles, stopped short, I'm sure, of what he really wanted to say. Still, Mussolini left the meeting knowing the Germans were coming, if only because this time Hitler had not brought up again his offer of assistance. What was coming was not an offer, but salvation, as much for Germany as it was for Italy. Still, each man has his pride, and now the Italian dictator focused on his one remaining option. To achieve at least one major victory before the Germans showed up and made it their show. So after Hitler finished barking at Mussolini, Mussolini went home and barked at his new chief of staff, Cavallero. The message was simple. Attack, attack, attack. So Cavallero got on with it. By the end of February 1941, with reinforcements, there were now 25 divisions in Albania. Of course, this being the Italian military, only 10 of those 25 divisions were in adequate condition and adequately equipped. But they would have to do. It didn't hurt Mussolini's feelings that Metexas had died on January 29th. Perhaps now the Greeks wouldn't fight so hard without their leader. As for Caballero, he hadn't gotten to where he was today by being stupid. Without telling his fearless leader, the chief of staff had two plans drawn up. One for if things went well, and the other, well, just in case they didn't. Metexas had done one last service for his country before his death. In early and mid-January, the Greek Prime Minister had several conversations with Prince Erbach, the German ambassador who, unlike his superior Ribbentrop, was not an arrogant blowhard, and retained respectful relations with Greece. Erbach explained to the alien Greek leader that Hitler was not like the unstable Mussolini. Germany did not want Albanian or Greek territory. Germany had already dealt with its traditional enemy, France, and had tried to negotiate an understanding with Britain. They were the ones continuing the hostilities. Metexas answered back that this soundness pleased him, and Greek equally had no desire for Albanian territory, but just wanted to be left out of the current conflagration. The problem was, one of these men was lying, and now Metexas knew who it was. So after his death, the new Greek leaders were more willing to discuss definite military support from Britain, which Hitler believed was inevitable all along. And so he made his plans in the form of Operation Merita. So, as February went by, Cavallero planned for his offensive, or rather, Mussolini's offensive. It was expected to begin later that month, or in early March. But either way, Mussolini had a surprise for his men, his partner, and for the world in general. Clearly, the Italian army, his army, simply needed to see a demonstration of manhood, of courage. And what better example was there than a leader showing up amidst his troops as the battle was about to commence? So, Mussolini left Italy on March 2nd and landed at Tirana Airfield in Albania. However, this political animal was wily enough to know the chances of him receiving a cold welcome were quite real. So, exiting the plane, he made straight for the car, waiting for him. But Cavallero, a wily political animal himself, arranged things when he found out about the trip. During the car ride from the airport, men of the Bari division, quote-unquote, recognized their leader and began cheering and trying to mop the car, but in a good way. 
Mussolini, who always had a good-sized ego, responded with smiles and cool waves of his hand, as if this happened to him every day. He decided things would turn around, and mostly because of him. The face-saving offensive began on March 9th. The Italians came on strong, with overwhelming numbers, and came up to the Greek line and started to engage. Of course, they paid a heavy toll for this, as the Greeks had dug in deep and had a small respite of their own. But before the first day was over, some of the ground lost by the Greeks had been regained. On the second day, the Italians moved in again, and as had happened when the Julia division was shattered, the fighting soon became a hand-to-hand contest, the adversaries able to look into each other's eyes. There were many deaths that day, Italian deaths, by grenade and bayonet thrusts. Mussolini was able to see some of this close-quarter combat from an observation post from Mount Kamarit and knew, in his heart, there would be no grand gesture of victory, something that would allow him to brag to Hitler about, or at least look the Nazi leader in the eye. Within a week, there were 12,000 Italian casualties. On March 16th, sick to his stomach, Mussolini called off the offensive. He flew back to Rome on the 21st. As the snow began to melt in Albania, the true grotesque picture was revealed. Thousands of missing Italian soldiers were found, the remains too hideous to look upon. This desire of Mussolini to pay Hitler back in his own coin i.e. a surprise attack, had cost the Roman Empire 51,000 dead and just over 64,000 seriously hospitalized, out of action for the foreseeable future. Of course, the victorious Greek army had suffered as well, sustaining 13,500 dead and 42,000 wounded. They were ragged and in need of fresh supplies. This was the army the Germans would face. As Mussolini had told Caviero when he first took over the Italian army, Greece was to have been a political masterpiece that had instead become a military nightmare. By February of 1941, British General Platt was asking himself, why were the Italians, who were being pushed around everywhere else in this general theater of combat, being as stubborn as hell, and successfully so, against him and his men? The answer, he did not know, had three pieces. First, General Fruski's men were defending the 2,000-foot height opening at the Dongolas Gorge, and as long as they had their guns and supplies, and they did, they could rain hot metal down on anyone who had to slowly make their way to the opening. Second, the men manning those guns were the best the Duke of Osta had, the men of the Savoia Division and units of the Bersegliari. Third, the British and their Commonwealth forces simply had to be held here, because if they got through, if Karen was taken, the port city of Misawa would fall, and that was the Duke's best, most important port. His headquarters, as well as his air force, even in the state that it was in, was based there. This was the whole game, right here. Failure was not an option. And in February, it didn't seem to be an option worth contemplating. The Allies were checked, and the Duke would do whatever he had to to make sure the situation remained that way. But for the moment, the enemy was not trying to force the opening, but instead were gathering supplies and planned on letting the RAF test the nerves of the well-entrenched Italians with bombing runs and strafing raids. And thus resupplied, well to an extent anyway. General Platt was ready to plan, again for the assault on the Dungalos Gorge. The idea was for the 4th and 5th Indian Divisions to hit the Italians with a left-right punch. First, the 4th Indian would dash in and take the hills called Sandchill and Briggs Pink and any others that were deemed necessary to the left of the opening. They had done this before, but were pushed back, exhausted as they were, by the effort. However, this time, after the heights were taken by the 4th, the 5th Indian would then come forward, the work already done, 
and then proceed to charge the gorge's opening, and another improvement was added. As the 5th Indian came on, they would be supported by RAF bombing, and every gun Beresford Pierce had in the area, and each gun had at least 300 shells for the task. The assault was to commence on March 15th. At first light on March 15th, the RAF came in hot, hitting the Italian guns and infantry units. At 7 a.m., the Allied guns opened up. Only then did the 4th move out. The hills, Sandchill, and Briggs were captured, but then lost by a quick-responding Italian counterassault. Still, command had decided the time had come, so units of the 4th were ordered to take hills further to the west. These captured heights would at least allow the 4th to menace the Italians, now on the closer hills. General Platt, perhaps being a bit desperate, then decided to be unconventional and have the 5th Indian attack the gorge opening, although the first part of the plan had failed. Obviously, he was hoping to catch the Italians unawares. But the 5th Indian was easily repulsed by the Italians high up on the right side of the opening, at Fort Dologorodok. As night fell, Platt decided to use the darkness, again trying to give the Italians something different than they had seen before. The 4th was ordered to move against Sandchill and Briggs Peak. They came on, but were repulsed again. However, their attack forced the Italian attention to the left, or west, of the opening. As the 4th engaged the Italians, the 5th was given the assignment to make their way up the heights and take the fort on the right side. Using the noise and distraction of their brother soldiers, they remained as quiet as possible until discovered, which allowed them to ascend the heights without bullets whipping over their heads, and by the time the enemy was on them, the Indians were within charging range of the fort, which is exactly what they did. Finally, the Indians' chance had come to avenge themselves on the very men who had killed their fellow soldiers. Some had died that day. The fort was taken. Yet proven their quality, the Italians retreated in good order, the Indians too exhausted to give chase. But these Italians, standing up to Platt's forces, were the Duke's best men. They did not panic. The British-led forces may have held the heights to the left of the opening, and now the right of the opening, but there were still Italian forces on Sandchill and Briggs Peak. But what's more, further along the gorge, but not a great distance from the opening, was a well-entrenched Italian fort that stood right in the middle of the path the British needed to take to get to Karen. It was simply called the Roadblock, and it was prepared to fulfill its name. Military prudence demanded that Platt's Indians could not move forward in earnest until Sandchill and Briggs Peak were swept clean. So, during the next night, Platt used two reserve battalions to attack the hills, but they were repulsed. That same night, the 5th attempted to expand on the area it controlled around the fort at the top, but they too failed. Deciding to stick with nighttime reconnaissance, Platt was informed that if Sandchill and Briggs Peak could be retaken, although it would be an arduous climb, there was a smaller fort called the Railway Bump that was across from the hills to the left of the opening. If the railway bump could be taken, then the roadblock could be hit from its side, as a diversionary attack was simulated in its front. Platt decided this was their best chance, and so planned accordingly. This assault was to commence on March 25th. But, not knowing the British plans, General Frusky had General Lorenzini, the man on the spot, attack the now British Commonwealth-held fort, Dolo Garotic, at the top. The Italians came on seven times between March 18th and the 22nd. Each attack was beaten off, and each time the Italians lost men they could ill afford. The Duke of Oost's plan for playing for time was unraveling quickly. Meanwhile, as we have seen, Ord Wingate with his Gideon force, had done well so far. Once they made it out of the bush, by using the popularity of Emperor Haile Selassie, as well as threats about what would happen to those who did not support the now-returned emperor, 
Winsgate's latest success was in shaking the nerves of his opponent, Colonel Natale, and his 7,000 troops. Gideon had less than 1,000. But that was changing fast, as tribal leaders were rediscovering their loyalty to Selassie and sending their men to him. Between Wingate's propaganda war and his habit of attacking forts behind Natale's main front, along the very road he would use if he decided to retreat to Deborah Marcos, a town in between his current position and the capital, and not to mention occasional RAF strafings, the Italian colonel had decided it was time to go. Wingate heard on March 3rd that the Italians were indeed about to break camp and did what he could to attack the retreating forces. But then Italian aircraft appeared and covered their departure. Still, the Allies managed to capture 2,000 troops as well as guns, badly needed supplies, and most important of all, transport vehicles. Many of Wingate's men would have been happy never to see life from the back of a mule again. Natalia's superior, General Nassi, had had enough of running and sacked Natalia, replacing him with Colonel Mara Ventano. But despite his fiery words to the troops, morale remained catatonic. However, things seemed about to take a turn for the better when Wingate, still his daunting self, prematurely advanced and ended up trapping himself between a larger force of Italians and, again, a larger force of locals, led by Ras Hallu, the man attempting to replace Selassie. But Wingate did the unexpected. He turned his force towards Hallu's men, ignored the Italians for the moment, and demanded the surrender of the Ethiopian imposter. The trick didn't work, but it did shake the nerve of Hallu, who took his men and hightailed it to the fort of Deborah Marcos to join his ally. The Italian force did the same. Wingate spent the days in between March 19th and April 3rd with a force no larger than 300 men. The rest were out harassing other, though smaller, Italian forts, making life hell for the 12,000 well-equipped Italians and their allies, now trapped in Deborah Marcos. And finally, a bit further south, in spectacular anticlimactic fashion, the battle between the opposing forces along the Kenyan-Italian-Somaliland border was going all the Allies' way after the fall of Kismayu on February 14th. What's more, after the occupation of Fort Jellab, 40 miles further inland on the 22nd, the southern door to Abyssinia was wide open. But as we have seen, Allied logistics at the time would only support the further advance of three decently equipped brigades. Also, this meant the stripping down of all the other forces remaining behind. Not that Cunningham expected much in the way of Italian resistance. In this theater, the defenders' morale and deployment was crumbling fast. So, as set up as best that could be, Wetherall's 11th African Division crossed the River Juba on February 23rd, with the 23rd Nigerian Brigade leading the way. As the men set out, the plan was for them to make for Mogadishu and then turn north to Harar, and if that city could be reached, it would mean the end of any organized Italian presence in East Africa. As the Africans moved out, each man stole glances when he could, but not up ahead in anticipation of Italians with guns, but instead towards the heavens, searching for the clouds that would bring the offensive ending monsoons. <laughs> <laughs> 